So uh, I would like to uh, explain. Um, so I would like to explain a, a certain kind of concept. The concept is that of the Lie group work, and there's a uh, there's an analogy between big groupoids and big groups. So uh, big groups are special cases, very, very special cases of Lie groupoids, and um, Lie groups um, are usually studied um, in terms of, let's say, representation theory or their infinitesimal counterpart, which is a Lie algebra. And the infinitesimal counterpart of a Lie groupoid is a Lie algebroid. And so that's why um, I'm going to be focusing on Lie groupoids and Lie algebroids. So, so let me start with Lie groupoids. Oops. Okay. So um, let me draw. So this is a geometry conference, Poisson geometry. Um, so let's do some geometry. So let me draw a line. And let me draw another line. And another line. And a point. And another point. I'll call this point S and this point T. This is R2. Coordinates are x and y. This is x, and this is y. OK. So this is um, R2 with two distinguished points. You could think of this s as being 0, 1, and this t is 0, minus 1. OK. And uh, R2 has been, so something has been done to it, very violent, remove this line. So that's why I show it as being dotted. So two lines have been removed. And then a special line has been um, distinguished, which is this x-axis. So that's our structure so far. Um, now, if I take a point inside this plane, okay, then um, there are two natural maps which I can apply to this point, which will project it into the distinguished line, which is the x-axis. Okay? One of these um, is the projection through S. The projection through S hits this point and projects it here. And the projection through this point, this other special distinguished point, Uh, projects this point to this point. Okay. So I'm going to say that, let me give this point a name. I'll call the point G. Okay. And the, uh, the projection via, the, by, via S is called S of G. And the projection via T is called T of G. So this means that what we have so far is we have a manifold G, which is R2. Um, let, me give this, let me give this line a name, LS, and let me give this the name LT. So I'm taking R2. I'm re violently removing the union of LS and LT. And um, what I've defined by, by choosing these two points, what I've defined is two maps which take each point in G and map it to the real line. So I've defined two maps. One of them is called T, and the other one is called S. And these map to X, which is R. And because I have removed this line, LS, uh, these two maps are well-defined, smooth maps everywhere. Right? So of course, there would be a problem if I had chosen a point here, then the projection through S, you know, it goes off to infinity. And so then we wouldn't get a point 
in R here, OK? But because I've removed those two problematic lines, these two maps, these two projection maps are well defined everywhere. Let me just do an another example. So uh, for example, if I had picked a point up here above this line, Oops. Well, yeah. It's not so important if it goes through that point, but let me shoot it this way. So this could be, let's say, a point H. And this would be um, S of H. And this would be T of H. OK, is that clear? OK. So we'll interpret the points in the manifold G as arrows. The points. G as arrows from the source to the target. So these two maps have names. They're called the source and target maps. They're smooth maps which map G to what we call the base, which is X. Okay. Now, um, OK, so that's number one. The second, the second thing is to notice that uh, there is a certain composition law which is defined on these points, the points of this set, R2 minus LS, LT. There is a composition law. So let's say this is number one. Number one is a statement which focuses on the two maps, S and, S and T. Number two is focusing on a certain composition law. OK. So how does this composition law work? Well, you see, I've chosen here two points. One of them goes from this point to this point, And h goes from s of h to t of h. And <clears throat> Uh, it's clear that there is no way for me to compose this point with this point in the sense that this point is going from here to here, and this point doesn't even start at the right place. So it's kind of like trying to um, compose two transformations which have the problem that the codomain of the first transformation does not even agree with the domain of the second transformation. So there's no way for you to compose them. OK, on the other hand, if I do want to compose this, this point with another point, what I could do is I could look at all the points whose target e is equal to this point. Right? So how can I find those points? Well, you know, in order for a point to have target equal to this point, it must lie on this line. So this is the line, this is the set of points with target equal to a fixed point, which is S of G. Okay. So what I can do is just pick any point along this line, let's say this point. And let me just uh, rename this point to k, because I want to use I want to use h for this point. This is now h. So I've chosen h, and let me just show you what its source is. Its source is this point. This is s of h. So what this means is that if we if we choose G and H such that 
the source of g is equal to the target of h, Now we're in a nice situation, because now h is going from here to here. That's the source, and that's the target. And g is going from here to here. And we can see from the diagram that we can compose these two points to get a third point. Where is this third point? Yeah, someone drew it with their hands. It's up here. So this point is gh. So if we choose g and h such that the source and the target agree in this manner, there is a well-defined composite gh inside g. And we call, we call gh the result of applying the composition law to gh. And the composition law is usually called m because it's like a multiplication. OK. So, um, <clears throat> so this is, this is a, um, so for the points that I drew, I drew these, these points um, so that they, uh, that they're generic, you know, they're just floating around somewhere. I didn't, I wasn't particularly careful in choosing this this pair, except for the fact that they coincide in this manner. Okay, but for these generic points, it's completely obvious how to define the multiplication in this picture because we use the geometry. We just extend the source fiber and the target fiber of the initial and final points, extend them until they meet. And because we're talking about lines in the plane, we know that they meet in exactly one point, and so there's a well-defined mul multiplication, right? But what I uh, would ask you to check is that if, you know, if these two points, if you chose them to be closer and closer to this special line which joins S and T, then this picture degenerates. You can kind of imagine everything folding until everything becomes vertical. And the interesting thing about this picture is that this composition law extends to the central fiber. So as exercise zero, which I didn't put on the online uh, list of exercises, which is now on the web, web, web page, I did not put this exercise, which is the exercise to check that the composition law extends over all of G. Is it clear what the question is? You just imagine, right, I just, just to like really emphasize the point. So if you, if you picked points, if I, if I picked a point like this, right? then you can see that it's, they're, they're kind of getting squished a little bit. Right? You need to pick the second one like this, somewhere on this um, source fiber. These are called the source fibers, and these are called the target fibers, because they are the fibers of the source and target maps. Okay? And so by extending these two lines, I get the composite here. So you can see that this picture is being replicated uh, at a smaller scale, or at least at a rescaled um, size. Yeah? Yeah, very good question. So we're going to get to that in a second. Yeah. So what he's asking about is, what about this special line that goes off to infinity? What if we add a point at infinity, right? Then then we would be able to map points on this line to that point on infinity. So that's exactly the next thing I want to do. Uh, before that, uh, I just want to continue here. Uh, there's a well-defined composition, uh, number three, um, uh, <coughs> 
So actually, j just to be a bit more precise, okay, um, when you have uh, a composition which is only defined on pairs which satisfy this condition, that's equivalent. <coughs> that's equivalent to saying that um, that M is def what is the domain of M? So M is not defined on G cross G because you need for the source and the target to coincide. So the way that we write that is by taking a fiber product of G with itself over the source and target maps. So G has a map to X, which is S. This copy of G has also a map to X, which is called T. And this set is the subset of the Cartesian product of G with itself. And it's the subset of pairs satisfying the condition that S of the first is equal to T of the second. Okay, and so that's, um, that's what is defined. OK, the third uh, property is that every arrow, every arrow has an inverse. Has a well defined inverse, G inverse. So there's an inverse map which takes every arrow to its inverse. And when I, you know, I, I'm being suggestive here, I'm saying that the inverse has to satisfy the axioms you think it does, which is that the composite, so G can be composed with G inverse, and uh, G inverse can be composed with G. To give an identity, um, so actually, maybe I wanted to say the identities first. Uh, yeah, sorry. That was supposed to be 4. So let me just, uh, let me erase the 0th exercise. and put three here, that each point in x has, a, uh, has an identity. So each point x in x has an identity um, OK? So here, what I'm referring to is that is that um, here we have x, which is the copy of the real line, right? So every point in the real line, since the real line is embedded in R2, okay, this means that there's a, you know, in particular, it is an arrow in this set G. Um, and if you think about it, what is the source of this arrow? Well, you have to extend this line and see where it hits x, but it hits it obviously right there, and the target is exactly this point again. So, so this identity is, a, is an arrow from x to x. Okay, it's an arrow from the point x to itself. And um, it composes in, uh, in the expected way. Okay? And so when I say that every arrow has a well-defined inverse, right? then what does it have to mean? It has to, if G goes from the source to the target, G inverse must go from the target back to the source. And so this must be the identity at the source of G, whereas this one has to be the identity at the target of G. So sorry, I was using notation like ID sub X. OK, so what is the inversion map in this, in this picture? Yeah, a lot of people just put up their hand and go like this. It's a good international symbol for the inverse in a groupoid. Um, so yeah, we have a we have a reflection, uh, be a, a reflection through the x-axis, and that gives us the inverse operation. Okay. 
Okay. Now, the important thing uh, that I want to say is that um, these are the axioms of a groupoid. This is what a groupoid is. A groupoid is something that satisfies these properties. A groupoid is a space with two maps to, an, to the base space. So it consists of a pair of spaces. And it has to satisfy this stuff. It has to have a composition law, a composition law which is very special in the sense that every point is, has an inverse. So it's almost exactly the same as a group. The only difference is that, is that there is a parametrized family of identity elements rather than a single identity element. And this, this, is the, uh, this is the main difference. Each point of this base space has an identity element associated to it. Now, in order to be a Lie groupoid, well, you know what to do. You just have to say that the spaces are smooth manifolds, which they are in this case. They're smooth manifolds. These two maps have to be smooth. This map, the composition map, has to be smooth. And everything else, everything has to be smooth, which it is in this case. So this is an example of a Lie groupoid. So this is a, a Lie groupoid. Any questions about this definition? OK, so uh, um, yeah, OK. Now, there is a key thing, which is that um, the, the multiplication is defined not on G cross G, but on this fiber product. So this is a fiber product like this. So um, let me just draw it in the way that you might have seen fiber products. G has a map S to X. G has a map T to S. And then we have G cross ST. G fits into this diagram. Okay. So whenever you have uh, smooth maps um, and you want to take their fiber product, which again means the set of pairs of points A, B, such that S of A equals T of B, that subset of G cross G, if you want to, uh, so that won't necessarily be smooth. Even though these two maps are smooth, this thing doesn't have to be smooth. This is the usual problem of intersection theory. You take the intersection of two things. Even though they are smooth, maybe their intersection is not smooth. So as in intersection theory, you want, you want to make some simplifying assumption so that will guarantee the intersection to be smooth. And what is that simplifying assumption? So how do you know when two submanifolds intersect in a submanifold? Transversality. So you want these two maps to be transverse. An easy way to guarantee transversality is if both of these maps are submersions. So. So if we assume if we assume that uh, these are submersions, this space is guaranteed to be smooth. And then it makes sense to say that M is a smooth map. So we can proceed with the definition. Okay? So that's a simplifying assumption that we make purely for that purpose, that we want to be able to say that M is supposed to be a smooth map. Okay? Um, and in this case, it is a submersion. You can see that um, the projection is just projecting through this point. And of course, you know, if, I, if I'm at any point, I can always choose a vector which is um, <clears throat> disjoint from this line. And that vector will go surjectively onto the tangent space. So both. Both of these maps, S and T, are surjective submersions. Uh, actually, I can't remember. Do we always, we always say they're surjective submersions? It doesn't follow, does it? No, but it does, because every point has an identity. So it's a surjective submersion. OK, so that's the definition of a Lie groupoid. And this is a really good example of a Lie groupoid, which we'll, we'll study some more um, presently. Um, OK. Now, uh,
Okay, so let me um, describe another example. So this is example one. So there's a very simple example. So for any for any space x x cross x, let's say for any for any manifold x x cross x is a Lie groupoid. Okay, a point x y inside here. Um, we're going to think of it as so it has two maps to x, the two obvious maps, the, the, um, the two projections. So the source is going to send this to y, and the target sends it to x. So in, in this sense, we view, in a very trivial way, we view the ordered pair x, y as an arrow that goes from y to x. So typically, we would draw it like this, we would draw, we could draw it like this. Well, yeah, let's say we draw it like this, x and y. Um, so we have a point uh, x, y. OK, and, um, and this, is a this, is a, uh, this is an arrow that goes from y to x. So, um, one way of kind of uh, describing this as a diagram is to look at the identity elements. What are the identity elements? They're the, the ordered pairs x, x. Those are the points that go from x to x. So the, the diagonal, this is the identities of x. And then we can see that uh, this point x, y has source, which is x. So we could think that uh, the source is the projection this way, the vertical projection. And we could think of this point as being the source of x, y. And we could think of this. So this is, uh, we could think of this as the target of x, y. Okay. And so in this way, we can, we can see that, um, that this point is viewed kind of like an arrow that goes from this point to this point. And if we wanted to, to write the composition law, then obviously to compose x, y with something else, we would need it to have source equal to the, to the target uh, x. So we would, we would want to compose like this. We would say that x, y goes from y to x, and then, uh, or let's do it the other way around. This goes from z to y, and then I can compose that with the map that goes from y to x. So this composition should be xz. So um, let's see, this is x and this is y. So yz would look like something like this, say. Okay. And then you do the same procedure. So that in order to find the composition of these two arrows, okay, you extend the source and target maps until they intersect like this. And we get this unique point, which is exactly xz. Okay. So this, this diagram is very similar to this diagram, okay. except for um, the fact that globally uh, this is not really the same. So, um, so let me just summarize this. So this is called the paragroupoid. This is called the paragroupoid. Now note this groupoid is uh, transitive. What does transitive mean? It means what you think it means. It means that any point can be, uh, can be joined to any other point. So for any pair of points in x, I can always find a groupoid element 
which takes this point to that other point. Okay? So in other words, there is, the, there is only one orbit, which is x itself. So sometimes people distinguish orbits, they require them to be connected. So if x is connected, let's say, okay, so this means that x is some connected manifold, okay, and I have a groupoid element that joins any point to any other point. Okay, so the, there's only one orbit for the action of this groupoid, um, and that is the whole space x. On the other hand, look at this, look at this groupoid. So this groupoid, we can see that if I choose two points in x, okay, then I can always construct a groupoid element going from here to here by simply you know, drawing the target fiber of the target and drawing the source fiber of the source and looking at where they intersect. Okay, and that will give me a point that maps from here to here. But if I want to, if I choose, if I was so unwise as to choose my initial point to be this special point where the ST line intersects the real axis, okay, then there is no way for me to find a groupoid element whose target passes through this point and whose source passes through a point which is not this, this point. So note that here, this is not transitive. Um, <clears throat> since S and T fibers at zero agree. So this means that there are two, well, actually, yeah, there are two orbits, well, three orbits, technically. The three orbits are, are greater than zero, are less than zero, and zero. So this is an example of a groupoid where not all points can be um, related to other points. Only, only the points uh, which are generic can be related to each other. Now, OK, I mean, uh, don't get confused by this. I mean, there are groupoid elements like this k, which take a point on this side and map it to a point on the other side. So in that sense, there, there are groupoid elements that take this orbit into that orbit. But people usually define orbits to be connected. So that's why I split them up into two separate orbits. That's not a big deal. And here, there's only one orbit. So this groupoid is definitely not isomorphic to that groupoid that I drew. So those are two completely different orbits, uh, two completely different groupoids. OK? That's why I called it example two. OK. Uh, now there's uh, <clears throat> two. Um, so any questions about these two groupoids that I've introduced? These two groupoids are both two-dimensional manifolds. They're, they're basically open sets. Well, so here I was more general. I took any manifold. But you could imagine taking the real line here. And this is just r cross r. So both these groupoids would be two-dimensional um, examples. Over, uh, over a one-dimensional um, base, which is just the real line. Okay, two, so if you took x to be the real line, then this would be a groupoid over the real line, and this would be a groupoid over the real line. And those would be two different groupoids, yeah? Yeah. OK, so perfect. That, that's exactly what I'm going to do right here. So I'm going to talk about isotropy. Um, OK, so let me get rid of the rest of the axioms here. OK, so there's, there's two um, basic um, so you know, the exercise that I gave was to show that the composition law extends to the central fiber. The, the exercise that I gave is to show that this composition law extends to the central fiber. So if you, if you prove that, that it extends, then you'll see geometrically what that composition law is. 
and you will identify which one-dimensional Lie group you're dealing with, which is a Lie group right here, which is. Uh, Yeah, good question. So you should you should do the exercise and see. Yeah, but be, but but for everyone else, I want to discuss what these concepts are. So, so let me talk about the relation to Lie groups. So there are there are two important relations between groupoids. Well, let me put it this way: from a groupoid, you can extract certain types of Lie groups. Okay, and um, one of them, uh, the most important is the group of bisections. Okay. So from a, gr a groupoid, I can extract a group, okay, which is called the group of bisections. So what is a bisection? Well, a bisection is what it sounds like. Uh, a bisection would be a submanifold of the groupoid. Like that. Uh, a submanifold, which is a cross section of the S, uh, S map and it's a cross section of the T map. So that means that each source fiber and each target fiber will hit this thing exactly at one point. I didn't draw it so nice because it kind of curves down. That's no good. That's better. Okay, so it's a bis it's a cross section of S and T. It's a submanifold um, which is a section of both S and T. Okay? To be a bit more precise or maybe so uh, equivalently, what I'll say is this. So um, it's, a, it's a section of S so that just means that if you compose sigma with S, you get the identity on X. So it's a smooth map, which is a section of S, and such that if you take the section and then apply T, you'll get a map from X to itself, which is not the identity. But you require that it's a one-to-one -one map. It's a diffeomorphism. So this, this uh, is an equivalent characterization of bisection in terms of maps rather than submanifolds. So the, ma the submanifold is a more uh, symmetric definition. But the, uh, in terms of a map, I'm going to say that it's a section of S, which when you compose it with T, gives you a diffeomorphism. So here you can see how it works, that, that um, you know, if I, to see the diffeomorphism, you take a point in X. Let's say uh, <clears throat> A. You follow the source fibers until you hit the cross section, which is there. And then you apply the target map. And you get here, or if I draw them here, so it might be easier to draw the initial point here, A. And then this would be um, phi of A. So this is phi. Okay. So this is the usual picture of the graph of a diffeomorphism. The graph of a diffeomorphism gives a submanifold of x cross x, which is a bisection of the pair groupoid structure. So there's always a map from bisections of the groupoid to uh, diffeomorphisms, or let's say automorphisms, of x. Okay. Now, um, here what I'm suggesting is that the bisections are not giving you always automorphisms of x, or they're not giving you all isomorph automorphisms of x. So this is a group 
which maps to this group, but it's um, you know, neither surjective nor injective. It's just a map, a homomorphism of groups. Okay? And the interesting thing is that these sections uh, can be composed. So what you can check is that if you take two sections, two bisections, gamma 1 and gamma 2, okay, then remember that the groupoid has a composition law. So that means that I can take points you know, in here and points in here which compose and take all compositions of points which are in gamma 1 with points in gamma 2. And that will give you another bisection. So the bisections can be composed um, using the multiplication law on the groupoid. Bisections can be multiplied using the groupoid composition. So that makes them into a group. Okay. Now, here you can see that uh, in this case, for the case of x cross x, where x is a smooth manifold, you can already see that there's a huge number of bisections. There's one bisection for every diffeomorphism. So it's an infinite dimensionally group. Could be an infinite dimensionally group. Which is possibly infinite dimensional. Okay. Now, <clears throat> uh, an important thing to realize, and we're going to see that coming up very soon, is that diffeomorphisms of X, if X is a smooth manifold, there's a huge number of diffeomorphisms. But if X is a complex manifold, then the replacement of, you know, every, everything I wrote here is the same that X cross X is a complex groupoid. That, um, that uh, bisections are complex submanifolds, holomorphic submanifolds, which satisfy this condition. And it's also true that I'm going to get a homomorphism to the automorphisms as a complex manifold. And we know that for complex manifolds, there may be very few automorphisms. Most complex manifolds have no automorphisms. They have no holomorphic vector fields. Finding a holomorphic vector field is much harder than finding a smooth vector field, because you don't have a partition of unity to just add them together. So, so uh, we're going we're to see that this Lie group could, could uh, you know, doesn't have to be infinite dimensional. In some cases, it could be a very interesting um, Lie group. I have until 12.35 or something, right, Rui? OK. OK. Um, now, take a look at this, this thing. So, if, so this example um, does have bisections. Um, but of course, the bisections, uh, when, you, um, when you use them to produce these diffeomorphisms, the diffeomorphism uh, phi, it's going to take a point x to, to some other point in, in x. And those, um, you know, the mapping that such a bisection defines is made up out of a bunch of little Lie groupoid elements. So that means that if I want to apply this bisection to some open set, right, then I'm going to follow the source fibers and then follow the target fibers. And I'll get a, a map from this open set to the, to the resulting open set um, that you get from applying phi. So this cross section, by using the groupoid, uh, you know, defines a map on the base from x to x. But we know that the orbits of this groupoid, are, are, there's not just one orbit. So there's three orbits. So this means that the, the bisections that I get here, they're going to give me very special kinds of automorphisms of x. They're not going to give me all automorphisms. I cannot have a translation, for example. Okay, the only types of automorphisms that I'll get are the ones that fix a special point in, in x. They all fix this point. So. In example one, um, we don't, the image of this map from bisections to diffeomorphisms of the real line is not surjective since the, po the point zero, the origin, is always fixed. So it's natural to ask 
and you could prove it in an exercise, we get all uh, automorphisms fixing a point. So that's a, another exercise which does not appear on, on, the, um, on the sheet. OK, so that's one way to get a group out of a, out of a groupoid, is to take the bisections. And the caveat is that it could be infinite dimensional, but it doesn't matter. It could be, still be very interesting. Um, <clears throat> OK, another way to get a group is to take isotropy groups. So for so at at each point, um, let's say x in x, we can consider all arrows in G, um, which send the point to itself. That's called the isotropy group at x. And you can express it in a nice way as all arrows which begin at x and which end at x. And this is a Lie group. And it's a finite dimensional when uh, when g is. Okay, so, so here, if I look at this example, let's say I choose a generic point, like this point. Okay. In order to have something in the isotropy, it means that I need for the source and the target to both be this point. So that means that the target, you know, whatever the group element is, like there may, there may be a point here in the isotropy here. But if, if this is in the isotropy of that point, that means that the t line through it has to intersect this point. So these points, you know, if I just use this expression, I have to take the intersection of the source and the target fibers. So then what will happen is that the source fiber of this point is just like this, and the target fiber is just like this, and these two lines intersect in a unique point. So the only thing in the isotropy is this point itself. So in this example, the isotropy is just um, the trivial group. Okay. On the other hand, if I choose this special point, then the isotropy consists of all uh, arrows that go from this point to itself. And we can see that any point along this line okay, will have source fiber and target fiber coinciding. right? And so the intersection of their preimages is just this whole line. So the isotropy is the entire um, x equals 0. So here we see that the isotropy groups are trivial, 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 and then they jump up to a one-dimensional Lie group. So the picture of the isotropy is that you just have a trivial group, and then all of a sudden you get, so it's, it jumps up. Okay, so the collection of isotropy groups is not that well behaved uh, compared to the groupoid itself. The groupoid is a nice smooth manifold. The isotropy groups, they don't really fit together in that, in that way, but they're useful to, in particular, you can see that in the, in the case of the pair groupoid, um, by the same argument that I used here in the generic case, the isotropy groups here are always trivial. They're completely trivial. So that's another way that you can tell the difference between example two and example one. OK. Now um, uh, I'm going to move on with example three. So, so we've covered um, the basic definition of groupoids, Lie groupoids, these two examples, the fact that they're not the same, Bi uh, bi bisections, which form a group, and isotropy, which forms a group. So now I'm going to address the question of whether we can extend this 
groupoid. So example three, um, we're going to extend example one to the compactification of R, where we add a point at infinity. This is called RP1 and is otherwise known as S1. So it's a circle. We add a point at infinity, and uh, we say that as you go to infinity in either plus or minus direction, they both hit that point. So we have RP1. Um, OK, so, uh, so the point is that now what we're doing is we're adding a point at infinity out here. And this line is going to be the source fiber that hits that point. So what we can do is we can add these two lines back in. OK, but, but so that, that solves one problem. That says that if you, if you have a point now which is on this forbidden line, then we'll say that the projection through S just maps it to the point at infinity. That's great. But if you choose a point which is directly on top of S, then there's no way to project that to R or to R union infinity. So that means that this point is still forbidden. So let me draw the result. Um, so consider RP2. So RP2 um, is going to, uh, so this is again R union, R, R2 union RP1 at infinity. So normally we draw it as if it was a disk. Well, it's a disk, a two-dimensional thing. And then the, the, the boundary, we have an antipodal identification on the boundary. So this is the standard picture of RP2. And inside there, we'll have a line, a projective line, which is RP1, which is x. Okay. Then we have uh, our forbidden points. One of them is called s. The other one is called t. So this picture on the interior is exactly the same picture as before. It's the same picture. We're just adding a line at infinity. And on the base, we're adding a point at infinity. So we're, yeah, OK. Um, and of course, uh, two points, two distinct points on the projective plane determine a unique projective line that goes between them. And uh, that's going to be our isotropy group at uh, the distinguished point here. So what we see here is that this copy of RP1 has a distinguished point. Uh, I can call it P0, say. Which is the, the line ST intersect the identity. It's exactly where the line ST hits the identity uh, copy there. And then we can do the same thing. We'll just use projective geometry now. So we'll say that given a point, um, I don't know what happened to, oh, there they are. OK, so given a point now on the projective plane, G, right, I can do exactly the same as before. I take the unique, so this is a point which does not lie on the forbidden two points, but it could be anywhere else. And then there's a unique projective line passing through S and G. That projective line is like this, and that and two projective lines, which are not the same, must intersect at exactly one point, and that defines S of G. And the same thing goes for T of G. Okay. So now we do exactly the same, but we just use projective geometry. Okay, so um, so the original two, the original sections, uh, the original um, uh, fibers that were uh, not permitted, there you could see them here. So if this is the point at infinity, say, then um, there were there are two um, sections uh, or two two lines, okay, which previously we had removed. These were removed in example one.
But now we don't remove them. We leave them in there. OK. So the result is that what we have is now is we have a groupoid, which is RP2 minus two points. This is a groupoid over the entire RP1, which is S1. And, and, uh, <coughs> and the orbits, what are the orbits now? What are the orbits at this point? You need to figure if I choose if I choose two points, any two points which are not the special point, any pair of points, right? Then in order to find the group element, a groupoid element taking this to this, I need to take the line, this line here and this line here, and intersect them. There's will there will be a non a, a unique intersection, and that will, will be the groupoid element taking this to this. So that means that one, one of the orbits is the complement of P0, and the other orbit is P0 itself. And then P0 itself. Is that clear? OK. So the, the last thing that I would like to do is to describe um, the, uh, the bisections of this. OK. So actually, uh, very quickly, I'll, I'll just need this, these two boards, and then we can, can break. So example four, I'm just mentioning example four since it's exactly the same as example three. Same, but in C instead of R. So we have CP2, CP2 uh, minus two points over CP1, the Riemann sphere, with orbits. So this is, this is now S2, okay, and which, which has orbits P1 uh, minus a special point, that point being exactly the same definition as before, and P0. Okay, so, so this picture is, the, the, is also the picture we tend to draw for the projective plane for in the complex numbers, since we, can't draw, since we can't draw the complex projective plane, we draw the real projective plane. So this is a perfectly valid definition of the groupoid, the source map, the target map, and the composition is defined exactly as before. Um, projective geometry works just as well, if not better, in the complex setting than in the real setting. OK. So now the question is that in example three and four, what are the bisections? What is, what is the bisection? OK. So let, let me. Um, Actually, let me focus only on example four, because remember I said that, uh, I mean, for something in the smooth category, in the real category, there could be tons and tons of, of bisections, because there's a lot of automorphisms of S1, a lot of diffeomorphisms of S1. But for CP1, uh, there's only a finite, so recall that the automorphisms of CP1 is PGL2C which is a three-dimensional Lie group, complex Lie group. So the bisections are going to map to this group. So there's a chance that the bisections will be finite dimensional. Okay. So in order to describe a uh, bisection, what do you do? Well, a simple way is to use the uh, submanifold definition. So I need to find a, um, a section of the source map. So I, I need to find a submanifold. Now, in order to be a section, it's a map from the base, right? So that means that the section, the submanifold gamma, it has to be isomorphic to P1. So a bisection, um, a bisection must be, be 
a copy of the base CP1 embedded in CP2 minus ST such that it hits S and T fibers exactly once. So there's not that many ways of embedding a P1 into CP2. There's actually two types of ways. One way is to embed it as a straight line. Yes? Straight line. It's a projective line. This is a, a P1 isomorphic to, uh, so gamma is isomorphic to P1, and it's embedded as a straight line. I tried to draw it straight, sorry. Another way to embed a P1 into P2 is as a conic, like a hyperbola or a parabola, right? But the conic intersects the source fibers in two points, because that's what we, what we know from ancient history. So that's no good. So it has to be one of these. There's no other choice. It has to be a line in the projective plane which avoids S and T. So in fact, the bisections is all the lines, all, all projective lines, avoiding S and T. That's what the bisections is. So how many such lines are there? Well, there is a classical way of determining that. There's something called the dual plane. The dual plane um, has points which are equal to the lines in P2. So every line in P2 corresponds to a point. So here we have the dual plane. This is supposed to be a little v to emphasize that we're doing in complex geometry, but whatever. The dual plane, each point in the dual plane corresponds to a line in the actual plane. Okay? So, so that means that this green line corresponds to a single green point in this dual plane. So this, that means that all the lines in CP2, all projective lines, are parametrized by the dual plane, which is another copy of P2. But there's a constraint on this gamma, which is that it's not allowed to pass through S or T. So how do we express that in the dual plane? Well, there's a whole bunch of lines that pass through S. In fact, there's a P1 worth of lines passing through S. And that's, in fact, um, giving us two lines in the dual plane. So these are all lines through S. And these are all lines through T. And we can see that there's exactly one line which passes through S and T, which is the line I drew, the vertical line. So maybe I draw that just, just for amusement. So what this means is that the bisections are really uh, equal to the dual plane minus two transverse lines. means that the bisections of G is the dual plane minus the two uh, distinct lines. If you remove one line from P2, that gives you C2. If you remove another line, uh, if you remove another line, that gives you C cross C star. And this is the group of bisections. It's a semi-direct product. It's called the affine group. The group of affine linear transformations of C. And this maps as a, it's an inclusion. It's a subgroup of PGL to C. So in this case, the group of bisections is a, is a two-dimensional Lie group. And it maps to the three-dimensional group of all automorphisms. And these are exactly the automorphisms, which preserves P1 
zero, the special distinguished point. Okay, so this afternoon I'm going to start talking about Lie algebraids. So let's leave it at that for now. Thanks for your attention.